Today we're beginning or continuing a message series called Bond Servant. Every believer, every disciple of Jesus Christ, and that's what believers are, is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our master. We talked about last Sunday, and we are his slaves, according to the Bible. Now, as a master, Jesus is not a cruel tyrant. Sometimes that word master, we think it's a cruel tyrant. But Jesus is a loving master. He loves us. He wants the very best for us. And we want to discover how we can grow as his disciples, how we can grow as his bondservants and become more useful to our master. God created you. He created me with a plan and purpose in mind. And we want to learn how to grow in that plan and purpose as we follow Jesus Christ in our lives. Today my message is entitled, Grow to Maturity. Growing to Maturity. Let's think about physical growth for a minute. Physical life begins at conception. And that's why abortion is wrong, because a human being was created at conception. And in the mother's womb, that baby grows and grows for nine months, and then they are born into the world. After the baby is born into the world, it learns to do all kinds of things. It eventually will learn how to walk. It'll learn how to talk. It continues to grow. It'll have go into some type of education process and continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to mature until they become an adult and become a productive member of society. In the same way, when a person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that they are born again, that they are saved. And so this new believer, whether they're 8 years old or 80 years old, begins their spiritual life as an infant, as a spiritual infant. And so that new believer must experience spiritual growth in order to mature spiritually and become a productive disciple of Jesus Christ. And so what is the difference between a baby and a mature adult, both physically and spiritually? Well, a baby is dependent. It's dependent on their parents to take care of them. A baby must be constantly cared for. A baby isn't, isn't really very productive, are they? They're more a taker than a giver. They need a lot of help. They're not a contributor to society. A mature, on the, a mature adult, on the other hand, is, is independent. They can take their, care of themselves. An adult is a, or should be a contributor rather than just someone who takes. An adult should be able to help those who are younger, who are more immature. A mature adult is able to reproduce themselves. And so those are some of the differences between a, a baby and a mature adult, both physically and spiritually. Now, physical growth is, is relatively automatic. I mean, you... Well, a baby is a lot of work, but it's relatively automatic. You know, you feed the baby, you take care of them, you put clothes on them, and they grow. They grow up, they mature. But spiritual growth is not automatic. Just because someone has been a believer for 5, 10, or even 20 years doesn't mean that they're spiritually mature. It's a process. Spiritual maturity comes through learning, and it comes through obedience to the Word of God. Let's look at our first scripture this morning, Ephesians chapter 4. I'd encourage you to take out the white sheet in the middle of your bulletin. There's several sheets in there. I find the right one. Here it is. Uh, it says, Grow to Maturity on top. It has the scriptures and the outline written there for you. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 14 says, Christ gave some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service until we all become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants. And so these verses talk to us about learning what God wants us to do, putting it into practice, putting what we've learned into practice in works of service. And in that process, we're going to grow to maturity. We'll no longer be infants. We'll become mature disciples of Jesus Christ. And so discipleship is the process of growing to maturity, and that's what we're going to talk about in more detail today. Now, just as an aside 
This coming Saturday is Valentine's Day. And uh, do you know what the most important secret is to keeping your marriage healthy and growing? I believe the most important secret is if both spouses are growing in God. Both spouses are growing in God. If both spouses are growing spiritually closer to Jesus, they're going to be growing closer together. One of the illustrations that I sometimes use in, in marriage counseling is, is a triangle. And at the top of the triangle is God. The bottom of the triangle is uh, the spouses, the husband and the wife. And as the husband and wife move closer to God, what does that do to their relationship to one another? They get closer together. And so the closer you are to God, the closer you'll be to one another. I believe every marriage problem, every relationship issue, every divorce can be traced to one or both of the spouses failing to grow to spiritual maturity. And so that's one of the benefits of growing in God. It enhances not only your marriage relationship, but it'll enhance every relationship in your life as well. So let's learn how to grow to maturity. First of all, we're going to look at a passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. We need to prepare our minds for action. Verse 13, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so really the first step in growing to maturity is to make a decision that you want to grow. Make a decision you really want to grow. I think a lot of people's like, it's really not on their radar, spiritual growth. It's like, I've got all these things to do, and spiritual growth, I, doesn't that just happen? No, it doesn't just happen. If you don't want to grow, it's not going to happen. You know, that's true of any goal in life, isn't it? If you want to pursue a goal in life, you have to make a decision to follow that goal. You need to be self-controlled, focused on what God wants you to do in your life, making it a priority in your life. And spiritual growth prepares us for faithful service to Jesus Christ in this life, ultimately, as this verse says, that one day Jesus will be revealed, and we want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, certain things can sabotage spiritual growth. Therefore, we must not conform to evil desires. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you, have, you had when you lived in ignorance. And so we tell our children, if you want to grow up, if you want to grow to maturity, one of the things the Bible teaches, you need to obey your parents. Well, that's important. God has given parents wisdom. We're not perfect, but he's given parents wisdom to teach their children and to help them to grow to maturity. In the same way, we have a heavenly father. And as believers, we're his children. And he has things for us to do. He has commands for us to obey. We need to be obedient children. Obedient children of God. The world around us, the world of unbelievers is living, the Bible says, in ignorance. They're slaves to evil desires. They do things that are wrong. They're enslaved to sin. In a certain sense, they can't help themselves. They're responsible, but they keep giving in to these evil desires. And before we were saved, we were slaves to these same desires. But now we are bond servants of Jesus Christ. And this verse says, do not conform to these evil desires. The world around us wants to squeeze us into its mold. We talk about peer pressure with teenagers. There's a lot of peer pressure on adults in our society to be like everybody else, to fit into the mold of our society. We see it on our televisions. We see it on the internet. This is what you should be like. Don't rock the boat. Conform to what society uh, requires, what society is doing. But God's word says, do not conform to the evil desires that are all around us, the evil desires you once conformed to. If you want to grow to be a world changer, if you want to grow to spiritual maturity, don't conform. Be a nonconformist to the world around you. Go against the flow. Follow Jesus. In fact, if you don't conform to evil desires, God's Word tells us we need to be holy in everything we do. That's the exact opposite. 1 Peter 15 says, Just as he who called you is holy, 
So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. That's spoken to each one of us. You are to be holy. See, what does it mean to be holy? Well, to be holy is, of course, it means to avoid these evil desires. That's part of it. But to be holy really means to be set apart for God's service, to be set apart for God's use. God is completely holy. There's no evil in him, and he calls us to the same lifestyle, to be holy, that he can use us for his purposes. God calls us to a lifestyle of commitment, commitment to his training program for our lives, so that we are prepared to do the things that he calls us to, a life that's radically different than the world around us, a life of holiness, a life of service, and that type of life will lead to dramatic spiritual growth. And so this morning, let's think about ourselves. Where are we at in our spiritual growth? Have you made a commitment to spiritual growth? Is it even on your radar, or is it something new that God is speaking to you this morning? God wants you God wants each of us to prepare our minds for action in this year of 2015. God wants us to be dissatisfied with where we're at spiritually, to press in deeper to God this year, to make a commitment to spiritual growth. And if we make a commitment, a renewed commitment to spiritual growth, then that means we're going to make some new priorities in our life this year. Something is going to change in our lives. Some of the things we used to do, we're going to stop doing or we're going to do less of. And we're going to make a priority to put God first in our lives. To have some new priorities that are going to help us in our quest for spiritual growth, to grow to maturity. You might think, well, I, I'm a pretty spiritually mature person. And that may well be true. But God wants you to go deeper. God wants you to grow in him this year to a deeper level. So let's look at some of the most important elements of spiritual growth. We need to obey the truth of God's word. Jumping down to verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, the truth of God's word. God's word is an essential component to spiritual growth. God's word is the truth that combats the falsehood that's all around us. We are being bombarded by things that are not true day in and day out, by people that talk to us, by things we read, by things we watch, by things we hear. The truth of God's Word is vitally important. The truth of God's Word is not just something to be learned, although we definitely need to learn it. Knowing God's Word is the first step, but it doesn't actually lead to spiritual growth. There are people that know the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation are spiritually immature. Spiritual growth happens as we understand what God's Word says and then we make a choice to obey it. We make a choice to apply it. We make a choice to put it into practice in our lives. And when we obey God's Word, something changes within us. Our thinking changes. Our actions change. Our priorities change. This verse speaks of purifying yourselves by obeying God's word. And so obedience is a means of holiness. As we obey God's word, with God's help, we become more and more holy, just as God is, in our daily practice. And that's essential to growing to maturity. So the verse begins, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, what truth is Peter talking about here? Let's go on. It says, You've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. And so everyone who is a believer has a sincere love for other believers. A sincere love. It's referred to, other believers are referred to as brothers. And of course, sisters is implied. Brothers and sisters. And so, if you love someone, you want to be with them. You want to be around them. You want to interact with them. You want to have a relationship with them. And so that's why being part of a, of a church family is essential to spiritual growth. It's also a sign that someone is truly a believer. 
because believers have this sincere love for brothers and sisters. Now here the Apostle Peter is encouraging believers to grow from having a sincere love for other believers to going in deeper, to loving others deeply from the heart, letting their love grow to a deeper and deeper level. We're going to talk in a minute about why relationships with other believers in a church family is essential for spiritual growth. The next verse tells us how spiritual growth begins. It says, you are born again by God's word. Verse 23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And so God's word is like a seed, the Bible tells us, a seed of truth that gets implanted into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And when we accept and believe that word, God's life begins to grow inside of us. In other words, believers are born again. Now you've heard that word kind of bandied around in the media, sometimes made fun of. What does it mean? Well, we're born the first time when we are born physically into the world. <clears throat> our mothers gave birth to us. That's our first birth. Our second birth, when we're born again, happens when we choose to believe the truth of God's word and we're born into the family of God. That's our second birth. It's a spiritual birthday. That's when we put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. And so God's word begins our spiritual lives. We become born again through the truth of God's word. And it is also essential to our subsequent spiritual growth. So how do you practically use God's word to grow to maturity? God's word shows us three main ways that we can use the Bible to grow spiritually. First of all, you need to read the Bible daily for yourself. Read the Bible daily by yourself. I encourage people to spend, the Bible doesn't say this, I encourage people to spend at least 15 minutes a day. That's what I found is kind of the minimum amount where you can really learn something from God's Word and spend a time praying about applying it to your life. If you think that 15 minutes you just can't fit it into your day, then your day is too busy. Uh, you need to drop something else and carve out at least 15 minutes to spend with God reading his word, and praying. In your bulletins is another piece of paper, a white page that says Daily Bible Reading Plan. I'd like you to pull that out. I usually bring that out during the beginning of a year and encourage people to use it to keep track of where you're at in your Bible reading. You see on the back page is all the chapters in the New Testament. If you open it up, there's all the chapters in the Old Testament. And as you read a chapter, you can mark it off here, and your goal is one day to completely read the whole Bible. And once you do it once, you do it again, because you're going to learn something new every time that you read. And it's important to read the Bible in order. I'd encourage you, if you are not reading your Bible every day, or you haven't done it regularly in the past, begin in the New Testament. Begin in the book of Matthew and read through the New Testament. We have New Believer New Testaments over there on the table on my left. Uh, it's an easy-to-read translation, the New Living uh, Translation, and we'd encourage you to pick one up. If you haven't, you can use any Bible you like, but if you don't have one, we'd encourage you to use one of those and get off to a good start. Very, very important. I've read through the Bible many, many times in my life, and every time I read God's Word, I learn something new. I learn something that's applicable to my life that I can apply and put into practice. So that's the first way to use God's Word in your life. If you're not doing that, I encourage you to make a commitment. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Secondly, you need to learn from a pastor teacher in a church family. That's one of the verses we read very, at the very beginning of the service. Somebody who's committed their life to studying and training others in God's Word. And you can get that right here at Life Church. The most important aspect of a godly pastor is not that they're a Christian entertainer. <laughs> 
And not that they tell the funniest stories or have the funniest jokes. It's that they teach the truth of God's Word. That's what you and I need to grow spiritually. Uh, that's what you need as if you're a parent to be able to train your children in God's ways. You need to be growing spiritually in order to train your children. The third way to grow in God's Word is to participate in a weekly life group or small group Bible study. God's Word talks about that. Those are places where you can interact. The Sunday morning service really isn't very interactive, is it? It's pretty much me talking and you listening. In a larger group, that's the way it has to be. And that is one of the ways the Bible tells that we learn and, and grow. But in a small group, you can interact. You can ask questions. You can discuss. You can get answers. You can pray for one another. And remember what you're praying for the next week. A very important way to grow spiritually. And so these are three important ways of using God's Word to grow to maturity. Personal Bible study, learning from a pastor teacher in a group setting, and finally in small group Bible studies. God's Word goes on to say, to grow to maturity, we need to get rid of sinful attitudes. Verse 1 of 1 Peter 2, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. And when we look at a list or this list of sins, what do they all have in common? Well, these sins are really attitudes that get in way of our relationship with other believers, with other people. Relationships, perhaps, in the church family. These attitudes are the exact opposite of loving our brothers and sisters from our hearts. Malice, deceit, envy, slander, saying things against other people. And we are to get rid of these sinful attitudes. Now, how would you apply this verse to your life? You'd look through that, you'd look at those sins, those attitudes that are not of God, and you say, God, is there anything in my heart? Maybe I've never even said something to somebody else, but is there anything in my heart that might be envious of somebody else? Is there anything in my heart that, any malice, I, I really just don't like this person. Is there anything in my heart of deceitfulness where I've not told somebody else the truth? And if God convicts you of something in this list, then repent of it. Say, God, I'm sorry. I acknowledge I've said something, I've thought something, I've felt something. That's not of you. Please forgive me. I want to love other people deeply. I want to love them from my heart. I don't want anything to be in the way of my relationships with others. Please forgive me and help me to change my attitude, to make it more like the attitude of Jesus Christ. Because those kind of things will get in the way of you growing spiritually if we allow those kind of sinful attitudes to grow in our hearts and minds. Then we must crave the spiritual milk of God's Word. Verse 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. What does it mean to crave? It means to long for. It means to earnestly desire. It means to have great affection for. And when you have a newborn baby and they're hungry, what do they do? Do they just lay there? No, they cry. And they make it clear that they need to be fed. And if the milk doesn't come soon enough, what do they do? They cry louder. They crave the milk that they need in order to grow to maturity. And so in the same way as disciples of Jesus, we need to crave the spiritual milk of God's Word. We need to hunger for it. We need to cry out for it. We must desire it above other things that take our time. You know, what do we spend our time on in life? The things we want to do. And if we look at our lives and we see that we're not spending time in God's Word on a regular basis, we're not spending time reading God's Word every day, our desire must be on other things. There must be other things that we crave, other things that we desire more than spending time with God. And so this verse 
It says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. This is actually a command. It's telling us to desire, to crave. Why is it so hard for many people to read the Bible every day? I could ask a question, you know, how many people here find it easy to read the Bible every day? And there wouldn't be a lot of hands. I won't ask the question. Um, and why is it so difficult? It seems like a simple thing. There's a lot of things we do every day. You know, we brush our teeth every day. We put on our clothes. We take showers. We go to work. We do all kinds of things every day. Watch TV every day. We do all kinds of things. Watch, watch, read the news. But why is it so hard to read our Bibles every day? It's because we have an enemy who doesn't want us to read our Bibles every day. And so he makes it very convenient for other things to, to fill the place of, for us to forget, for us to become consumed with things that are not leading us to grow spiritually. And so we need to be aware of those things and ask God to give us a greater desire for his word a greater desire to know and apply God's Word to our lives. Because as we crave that spiritual food of God's Word, it's going to help us to grow up. Let's read the whole verse, verse 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up. Underline those words, grow up. I want to grow up more than I already am so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Why crave God's word? Because just as a baby needs milk to grow, so believers need the spiritual milk of God's word in order to grow to maturity. You cannot grow to spiritual maturity without God's word in your life on a daily basis. If you don't get the milk of God's word in adequate supply, your spiritual growth is going to be stunted. You're going to be, you grow to a certain point and then you're just not going to grow anymore. You're going to just stay the same. Our salvation is something that we need to grow up in. There's always a greater degree that we need to grow to maturity. And we grow so that we become mature adults, so that we can reproduce ourselves. As we grow to maturity, God can better use us to disciple others, to lead others to Jesus Christ, to grow from becoming just a taker and a receiver of God's Word to being a giver of God's Word. Not just always taking in, but we've grown to maturity so that we can speak God's Word to others. We know it well enough that we've applied it to our own lives, and we can teach others. We can teach our children. We can teach our friends, we can teach our relatives. I recently read a story about a man named Jason Brown. And I don't follow football a lot, but I'm told that Jason was with the St. Louis Rams and he was pro football's highest paid center. I had no idea. But he was cut from the squad in 2012. And his agent gave him some opportunities to try out for some other teams, and he got those opportunities, but Jason turned them down. He left football, and he moved to North Carolina and bought a farm. It was quite a change of careers. And so everyone is asking, well, Jason, what is going on? This is really strange. Well, what was Jason's story? Well, Jason was a professing Christian. He claimed to be a Christian, but he said he and his wife, Tay, were having all kinds of marriage problems. They were headed for divorce. He realized his life was just consumed with football, money, and all the things that all these millions of dollars could buy. And it was leading to uh, all kinds of difficulties in his family. Jason said that his faith in Christ was simply, in his mind, a ticket to forgiveness, a ticket to heaven, and it really had very little influence on his daily walk, his daily life at all. And so he realized that something was very amiss in his life. And he decided to make a change. He decided to follow God's plan for his life. 
And Jason felt that God was calling him to buy this farm, to leave football completely, to buy this farm in North Carolina. He called it First Fruits Farm. And he believed that God's plan for his life was to begin to grow food, to give food to needy families. And over the last couple of years, they, they've uh, donated thousands and thousands of pounds of food to needy families. And as they distribute the food, they share God's love. They th- share Jesus' love with these, with these people. And he seeks to boost uh, people's understanding of God's word at the same time. A complete lifestyle change. And when Jason was asked, you know, what, why did you make such a drastic change, such a radical change in your life? He answered with one word. He simply said, obedience. Obedience to Jesus Christ. God's word. When applied to our lives in obedience, leads to growth, it leads to change, it leads to radical change as we follow God. Well, this is still almost the beginning of 2015. I'm sure we all have plans for the year, and hopefully these plans, the plans that you and I have for 2015, are not just plans that we've dreamed up, but they are plans that God has given to us. God's plan for every person here, I'm convinced, in 2015 includes spiritual growth. God wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to move to a new level in Him. For some of you, God's plan may be that you become a believer and disciple of Jesus Christ for the very first time, to take that first step. And we're going to give you an opportunity in a few minutes. For those who are believers, spiritual growth in 2015 isn't just going to happen all by itself. It needs our cooperation. And so prepare your mind for action in 2015. Make a commitment to grow spiritually. That at the end of this year, as you look back, you say, God, I have grown spiritually. I'm more mature spiritually at the end of 2015 than the end of 2014. Get rid of any attitudes, any behaviors that are hindering your growth. Make God's word a priority in your personal life. In learning from others on Sundays and in small group Bible studies. God has many wonderful blessings for us as we grow to maturity. And I pray that we would each press into God in a new way in 2015. Now the first step, of course, to spiritual growth is to allow the seed, the truth of God's word to be planted in our hearts, to become a believer. And we do that by admitting that we've sinned, Believing that Jesus died to forgive our sins and committing our lives to him. So I'd like to ask you all to bow your heads right now. We're going to pray. If you're not sure you're a disciple of Jesus Christ this morning, if you'd like to recommit your life to him this morning, I'd encourage you to pray after me something like this. Father, today I admit. I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross that my sins might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior. Let's keep our eyes closed. I'd like to ask each one of you to consider making a commitment this morning to spiritual growth. Specifically, making a commitment to reading your Bible each and every day and spending some time in prayer each and every day, making that a top priority in your life. If you want to make that commitment, let's keep our eyes closed. If you'd like to make that commitment, I'd just like to ask you to raise your hand. I'm making that commitment. doesn't mean... You know, God's going to strike you with lightning if you get sick and you can't do it one day or something happens. But that's what you want to do. That's your heart. Just raise your hand if you'd like to do that. God sees those hands. Let's pray. You can put your hands down. Father, we thank you, God, that you've given birth to every believer here through the truth of your word. And some of us here, God, this morning are spiritual infants, some are children, and some are adults. But wherever we're at in our spiritual journey, God, we say we want to grow this year. We want to grow spiritually. We need your help for that. 
And today we make a commitment to preparing our minds for action. We make a commitment to making some changes in our lives. We choose to rid ourselves of attitudes and behaviors and things that don't contribute to our spiritual growth. We repent of those things. We ask for forgiveness. And we make a decision to, to honor you by putting you first in our lives, by reading your word each and every day and spending time in prayer asking you how you want us to apply it to our lives. Help us, God, to be consistent in learning your word each and every Sunday. And not just hearing your word, but thinking and praying about it so that we make some changes Monday through Saturday. So that we grow into the people that you want us to be. Father, we pray that each person here who is not part of a small group, that you would help them to find a way to be part. And we pray that we would continue to be able to cause these small groups to grow and more people to be involved, that you would make things happen for schedule difficulties and other problems. We want to grow up in you, God, so that we can carry out your plan for our lives. God, we want to reproduce ourselves spiritually. We want to lead more people to Jesus. And we pray, God, that you would help us to understand the truth, not just for ourselves, but so that we can teach and bring others into life with you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives and in our families and in our church and what you're going to do the rest of this year. We look forward to it, the exciting things that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.